church family, I invite you to open up in your copy of God's Word to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 19 is our text for today. The title of our message is The Reality of Wrath and Rescue. The Reality of Wrath and Rescue. Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 38. You follow along in your copy as I read from God's Word. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door, and they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons, and law, da- sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to, be, to his sons-in-law to be jesting. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought him out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. You have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Now Lot went up out of Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zoar. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come in to us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay down with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. The next day the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. Firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. This is the word of the Lord for his church today. Would you pray with me?
Heavenly Father, what a weighty passage of Scripture. What a passage that is gross with sin and filled with the hope of rescue. Teach us, Father, from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to start on a very serious note. I know no other way to start when I read a passage like this than on a serious note. And that note is the wrath of God. The wrath of God. God's wrath is his righteous anger and punishment toward those who rebel against him. I'm going to use the word wrath a lot today. When we hear the word wrath, we need to understand what we're saying. It is the righteous anger and punishment of God toward all who rebel against him. Brothers and sisters, friends, when was the last time you pondered the wrath of God? I've been pondering it all week. And it's heavy. And it's terrible. And it's righteous all at the same time. I don't mean when was the last time you had a passing thought about the wrath of God. I mean, when was the last time you stopped and you mulled it over in your mind, you pondered it, you considered it, you meditated upon it, you thought deeply about the wrath of God. Friend, we are fools if we fail to ponder the wrath of God. For God's wrath towards sin is great, and Scripture is clear, we are great sinners. God's wrath towards sin is great, and we are great sinners. In Genesis 19, we are confronted with the, re- with the reality of God's wrath. We must not ignore it. We must take time to stop and ponder it and consider it. Let it make us tremble. But we don't have to keep trembling in fear Because in Genesis 19, we're also confronted with the reality that God is a rescuing God. He not only pours out wrath, but he has a plan of rescue. And so I believe that Genesis 19 is teaching us this, church. The sobering reality of God's wrath should lead us to trust in God's plan of rescue. The sobering reality of God's wrath should lead us to trust in God's plan of rescue. At this point in Genesis, God has called out Abraham as the man through whom the promised deliverer would come. He's entered into covenant relationship with Abraham, and he's promised Abraham a biological son by his wife. And we're going to get back into that promise. But today we take a pause because the story takes a pause from that and focuses in on Lot. We have learned about this man named Lot who is Abraham's nephew. And in chapter 13, we learned that Abraham and Lot's herds were beginning to compete for the land. You remember that? And so they chose to separate. Abraham gave Lot first choice of where he was going to go, and he chose to settle in the city of Sodom. And in chapter 13, we were told that the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. That's what we read in chapter 13 about Sodom. And that's where Lot chose to settle. Then in chapter 18, last week, we learned that Abraham was visited by three men who turn out to be none other than the Lord and two of his messengers or angels. And the Lord tells Abraham that he is getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Abraham, loving his nephew Lot, pleads with God to spare Sodom if, and he works his way down, you remember, if, if even only ten righteous people are found there. God agrees, but ten righteous people are not found in Sodom. And so God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But... These messengers, as they go, God sends them there to see the sin, to carry out the destruction. We also see that these angels then, on behalf of the Lord, rescue Lot from Sodom. This is a hefty passage of Scripture. There's a lot we can learn, but I want to center our thoughts today around three truths concerning God's wrath and his rescue. Church, I want us to ponder today, one, the reason for God's wrath, two, the nature of God's wrath, and three, the rescue from God's wrath. The reason, the nature, and the rescue 
when it comes to God's wrath. Let's start with that first one, the reason for God's wrath. And I, by the way, we're going to jump around a little bit in, um, in chapter 19 um, as we walk through this. The reason for God's wrath, church, is human rebellion. The reason for God's wrath is human rebellion. Now, let me, let me pa- pause there and say that's really not the whole reason and really not the most foundational reason. The most foundational reason is God's holiness. The reason that God pours out wrath, first of all, has to do with his own character. He is a holy God, and so he must punish sin. But this passage focuses less on who God is. That was chapter 18. This passage just focuses more on who we are as people. And so we're going to focus our answer on that. The reason that God pours out wrath is because of human rebellion. What are the circumstances which draw out the righteous wrath of God in this passage? It is human rebellion against God. The reason God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah is not that God just finds great joy in destruction. It's not that, that, that God has a bad temper and he just snapped all of a sudden. It's not that he was just bored up in heaven and thought, you know what, it'll be fun today to watch some cities burn to the ground. That's not why God poured out his righteous wrath. It's because of human rebellion. The people in Sodom had rebelled against God, their creator. To rebel against God is to reject his way for our way. You see, it's, it's easy to sit and say, oh, I'm not, a, I'm not a rebel against God. But if I think, have I ever rejected God's way for my way? Yep, I have. Lots of times which means I'm a rebel against God, which means you're a rebel against God. We rebel against him. I think we see at least three clear examples of human rebellion in this passage. Let me share these with you. First, we see that people rejected God's created order. They rejected God's created order. It's the first example of human rebellion that we see here. The angels of God enter Sodom. Lot greets them. They say they will spend the night in the town square, but Lot strongly persuades them to stay at his house. And it doesn't take long to understand why Lot doesn't want them hanging out in city streets there in Sodom. The men of the city have plans to force themselves upon the visitors in a sexual manner. After Lot feeds the two men, who we know are messengers from God, verse 4 tells us that the men of the city surrounded Lot's home and demanded that he hand over his two guests. And verse 5 gives us their reason. The men of the city said that we may know them. Now, some people who don't like the biblical truth that homosexuality is a sin have desperately tried to reinterpret this passage along with other passages in Scripture by forcing upon it a clearly wrong interpretation. And they say that the men, and I want to share this with you in case you come across this, they say that the men of this city simply wanted to get to know the visitors. They simply wanted to show them hospitality. This is a real interpretation that is in our society today of this passage that is a wrong interpretation. They wanted an op- This is what people say. They wanted an opportunity to show hospitality to the visitors. But listen, that is simply a ridiculous interpretation that's made out of a desperate attempt to justify the practice of homosexuality. The meaning of the text is clear. The men of Sodom intended to have physical relations with the two men who had come under Lot's care. Let me quickly give you a few reasons why we know this is the case, just so you know how to respond to someone who may hold this interpretation. First, the Hebrew word to know, they say we, that we may know them, is not always used this way, but it is used multiple times throughout the Old Testament to refer to, to sexual relations, to know the other person in that way. Second, if all they wanted was to get to know the two men in a hospitality kind of way, why then does Lot offer his virgin daughters in exchange? Now, that's a whole nother part of the grossness of this passage, but hold that for a a moment. Why then does he offer that as as an exchange? That would make no sense. They already know his daughters in a let me get to know you, hospitality kind of way, those two girls grew up in that city. They, they knew them. So that, that, that refutes that wrong interpretation. Also, if all they wanted was to get to know the two men, why does Lot call their act so wicked? Why would hospitality be called a wicked act? And furthermore, why then is Lot the one who is rescued and the men destroyed? If Lot was standing in between them trying to show hospitality to these visitors. It's, those, it's, it's ridiculous. 
But that's the length to which people will go to reinterpret God's word to fit their lifestyles or what they want to believe about God and what they want God to say about us and how we are to live or not to live. But what I really want to, us to pay attention to is the fact that this was rebellion against God's created order. What these men were wanting to do was an act of rebellion against God's created order. Friends, sin is sin. All sin is deserving of God's wrath. But at the same time, Scripture points us to the fact that there is visible progression along the path of sin in which humanity is drawn further and further away from God's original design in creation to the point where his wrath must be unleashed against human rebellion. And homosexuality is clearly a rejection of God's created order. It's a rejection of God's created order which distinguishes between men and women. It's a rejection of God's created order which defines marriage as the joining of a man and a woman only. And it is a rejection of God's created order which sets forth sexual relations as God honoring only within the confines of a marriage between a man and a woman. And we know from other passages that homosexuality was not the only sin of the people of Sodom. They were guilty of all sorts of sin, and we read about that in other places in Scripture. But the sin that is highlighted here is their homosexuality. Again, it's not because homosexuality is any more deserving of God's wrath than, say, greed or lust or gossip or hatred, but simply because it, it is a very visible way of seeing human rebellion against God's created order. But friends, there are all sorts of ways that we rebel against God's created order. Ignoring gender roles in marriage is a rejection of God's created order. Ignoring God's command to be fruitful and multiply is a rejection of God's created order. Treating animals as though they were human, which is really popular to do in our society, is a rejection of God's created order. Acting like you are a different gender than your God-given biological makeup indicates, which happens to be somewhat popular in our society today, is a rejection of God's created order. Failing to submit ourselves completely under the authority of God, who is our creator, is a rejection of God's created order. And if you're paying attention to that last one, that means every single sin is a rejection of God's created order. Every time we sin, we are failing to see the order that God is God and we are not. Which means... Every sin deserves God's wrath, which means we deserve God's wrath. So the first example that we see here, and I had to spend a little time on it because it is an important part in our passage, is that humanity rejects God's created order. Another example of human rebellion we see in this passage is that people reject God's warning. People reject God's warning. We see the men of, of the city are about to harm Lot because he won't send out the two men. So the two men who are angels grab Lot, pull him back into the house, they shut the door. And the angels have now seen enough. The wickedness of the city has been confirmed. It's time for God's wrath to be poured out. And they graciously allow Lot to get any of his family out before they destroy the city. Now, Lot is married. He has two daughters, and his daughters are engaged, to use the modern language. They wouldn't have used that language then, but we'll just say they were engaged to be married. So Lot warns his soon-to-be sons-in-law, up, get out of this place. The Lord is about to destroy the city, but the text tells us his sons-in-law thought he was joking. They thought he was joking. Now, perhaps this speaks to Lot's lack of credibility, but it definitely speaks to the rebellion of human hearts. How many times throughout history have humans failed to heed God's warnings? How many times have we failed to heed God's warnings? How many souls throughout human history have already walked through death's door only to realize that those warnings were real as they begin to experience the reality of God's wrath? Lot's two sons-in-law were destroyed with the rest of the city because they rejected God's warning. It's an example of human rebellion. There's a third example of human rebellion, and that's this. People reject God's word. We reject God's word. See all these examples of human rebellion here. We reject God's word. Later in the story, we're told about Lot's wife. And the angel gives Lot, his daughters, and his wife, who are going to leave the city, a very clear command. There's, there, it's just so clear. The, the angel says, escape for your life. 
Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Don't look back or stop. You leave the city. You keep going to the city of Zoar at that point because that's where they Lot kind of talks him into letting him go. All right? So you keep your eyes fixed ahead. You don't look back. Seems simple, right? God gave her a command for her protection, but what does she do? She rejected God's command. Text tells us that she was, she was lagging behind Lot, which probably speaks to the fact that she really didn't want to leave. And then it says that she looked back, and she suffered the consequences. But Lot's, Lot's wife looked behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. She rejected God's word. Her eyes followed her heart, and her heart was clearly back in Sodom. Church, every rejection of God's word reveals that we have exchanged love of God for love of the world. Every rejection of God's word, every disobedient act reveals that we have exchanged love of God for love of the world. So we reject God's created order, we reject God's warning, we reject God's word. Humanity is in rebellion against God and that is the reason for God's Next, we see the nature of God's wrath. In church family, the nature of God's wrath is complete destruction. The nature of God's wrath is complete destruction. Here, I simply want to point out the important fact that God's wrath is not something to be taken lightly. Church, God's wrath is fierce and it is final. It is complete and it is consuming. It is destruction and it is death. In verse 13, the angels say that God has sent them to destroy the city. In verse 14, the angels say that the Lord is about to destroy the city. <clears throat> and then after Lot requests the angels to allow him to flee to that little city that later became known as Zoar, because that means little, instead of fleeing to the hills, which the angels granted, one sign of their very much mercy and grace that they showed to him, we read this in verse 24. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Two times in that one verse, just in case we're tempted to think this was simply a natural phenomenon that happened to fall upon Sodom at that particular time. Two times in verse 24, we are told that this that disaster was from Yahweh, the Lord God. This is clearly his wrath, and it is terrible. Can you imagine the scene with me for just a moment? Fire falling down on people, an entire city, really cities, being burned alive. Lot's sons-in-law may have laughed at Lot's warning, but I doubt, church, that they were laughing as fire fell down from heaven upon them and their city. Friends, the wrath of God is no laughing matter. It is serious. It is sobering. There is no escaping it once it falls on you, and there is no relief once it falls on you. The scene is bleak in verse 28 when we see Abraham looking, quote, down toward Sodom, verse 28, and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. That land looked so good to Lot about 23 years earlier. But now it's been destroyed. I say it all the time, church, and I will say this as long as the Lord puts breath in my lungs. No matter how good sin looks on the outside, it always leads to destruction. Lot saw that land 23 years earlier. He said, that looks good, but the city was filled with wickedness. But he went there anyways, and look where it has left him. Fleeing from a city that is burning to the ground. And just in case, church, we're tempted to think that this is just the God of the Old Testament, which some people happen to believe. The God of the Old Testament is the God of wrath, but the God of the New Testament is the God of love. Just in case we're tempted to believe such a thing, let me read to you the words of God spoken by God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the New Testament. Numerous times Jesus spoke of those who are rejected from God's kingdom being sent to a place where Jesus said that there will be, quote, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said that over and over when he was here on the earth. Jesus described hell as a place where, quote, the fire is not 
quenched. And Jesus told a story about a man who died and was in Hades, the text tells us. And Jesus said the man was in torment. And the man said, I am in anguish because of this flame. And the man, Jesus said, cried out for mercy to be shown to him simply by having a drop of water placed on his tongue. And the answer he received was, I'll put it short in the short version, the answer he received was no. No. Friend, God's wrath is not a slap on the wrist. It's not a temporary discomfort like a timeout. It is complete destruction. That's the nature of God's wrath. So we've seen the reason for God's wrath. It is justified because he's a holy God. As we learned last week, he's just in all his ways. And as we see, it's not just random anger. It is directed towards clear human rebellion against him. And we've seen the nature of God's wrath. It is terrible. But praise God, we not only see this reason for God's wrath and the nature from God's wrath in Genesis 19, church, we see rescue from God's wrath here. We see rescue from God's wrath. And what we learn, this is the third truth I want to share with you, is this. The rescue from God's wrath is divine intervention. The rescue from God's wrath is divine intervention. Here's what I mean by that. It is something that God does. It is God intervening into our human rebellion and choosing by his grace to rescue us out of it. In other words, just like Lot in this story, if it wasn't for God stepping in with a plan of rescue where God does the work of rescuing, no one would ever be rescued from God's wrath. Rescue is dependent 100% upon divine intervention. Throughout this passage, we see that God clearly does the work of rescuing. Just think back through the passage. Glance your eyes back through. Notice all that God does to rescue Lot and how little Lot does, how little he contributes to the rescue. God sends his angels into Sodom. The angels, who are messengers of God, reach out and grab Lot and bring Lot into the house and shut the door and strike the men of the city with blindness, thus rescuing Lot from the wicked men. Then the angels have to literally grab Lot hold of Lot and his wife and daughters, the text tells us, by the hand. They literally drug them out of the city. The text says they brought him out and set him outside the city. There is no doubt who gets the credit for the rescue in this story. It is God. I want to show you as we as we look at this final point, I want to show you I think, three specific ways that rescue depends upon divine intervention in this passage. Look with, look with me at this and let this lead you, if you've never believed in Jesus, if you've never believed in God's plan of rescue, to believe in God's plan of rescue through Christ. And if you have, to rejoice in God's great work in your life that he gets all the credit for. First way we see that rescue depends upon divine intervention is that, that it depends upon God's mercy to sinners. Rescue depends upon God's mercy to sinners. What does mercy mean? It means when you don't get what you deserve. You deserve punishment, but you don't get it. Lot didn't get rescued because he deserved to be rescued. He was rescued because God showed him mercy. Yes, Lot took in the visitors and showed them hospitality when no one else in Sodom did. Yes, Lot left the safety of his house to confront the wicked men of the city. Yes, Lot condemned their homosexual activity as wicked. Yes, the apostle Peter even calls Lot righteous, saying that he was, quote, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked and that he was, quote, tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. So where there was this glimmer of faith in the Lord in the life of Lot compared to the rest of the people in the city, but clearly, clearly, Lot was not a perfect man. He chose to live in Sodom to begin with. And even in this passage, we see that he offered his daughters to the wicked men of the city, and he hesitated when it was time to leave. Clearly, Lot was not a perfect man. Far from it. But we've also learned in Genesis that perfection is not required to be counted righteous by God. Faith is required. Praise the Lord. Lot was rescued not because he deserved it, friends but because God showed him great mercy. And that's the only way anyone is ever rescued from the wrath of God. Notice verse 16. But he lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, 
And then notice this phrase, the Lord being merciful to him. In other words, it's kind of like, it's kind of like God kind of pauses the story and says, just in case, just in case it wasn't clear, Lot's not deserving any of this. I am being very, very merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. It can't get any clearer. Lot was rescued because the Lord showed him mercy. Rescue from God's wrath always depends upon God showing mercy to sinners. Another way we see that rescue is completely dependent upon divine intervention is this. It depends upon God's faithfulness to his word. It depends upon God being merciful to sinners. It depends upon God being faithful to his word. Note the subject. God is doing this. God is being faithful to his word. You remember Abraham's intercession before the Lord back in chapter 18? Abraham, the man God had entered into covenant relationship with, pleaded with God to spare the city for the sake of the righteous, which God said he would do. Remember, God agreed. God went along with Abraham's request. He said, yes, I will spare it if there are any righteous. Now, God didn't spare Sodom, but he did relocate Lot to another city, and he spared that city. In other words, he kept his word. He spared a city that had a righteous man living in it. At least one that by his grace, God counted righteous. He kept his word to Abram. Notice verse 25. So it was, verse 29, so it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. What's the reason given here for Lot's rescue? We've already seen one reason. It's the mercy of God. What's the reason given here? God remembered Abraham. God remembered Abraham. In other words, Lot was rescued because God was faithful to his word to Abraham. Friend, God, who has said that everyone who places their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved from his wrath forever. The God who said that, who's made that promise, he is faithful to keep his word. If you stand before God one day, which we all will, and, and he were to ask you, I'm not saying this is how it's going to happen, but he were to ask you, why should I let you in? The answer will not be because I did whatever. It will be, God, because you are faithful to your word and you promise that every sinner who believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. That's my only hope, that you will remain faithful to your word and church, God always remains faithful to his word. God's Rescue depends upon God's mercy to sinners. God's rescue depends upon God's faithfulness to his word. And then the final thing I want you to see is that God's rescue depends upon God's sovereignty over wickedness. Now, by sovereignty, I know it's a big word. It means that God is in complete control. So it's complete control over wickedness. Now, this is, this is, this is a little harder to see in this passage, but, but it's fun if we'll take just a minute and, and see it. I believe there is a very incredible God-glorifying way that we see God divinely intervening, not just in the story of Lot, but in the story of humanity, in your story and in my story. Now, unfortunately, the story of Lot does not have a fairy tale ending. What do I mean by a fairy tale ending? And they all live happily ever after. All right, that's fairy tale ending. That's not how the story of Lot ends. The story of Lot's life ends in a, on a morally gross and tragic note. In verses 30 through 38, we learn that Lot eventually left Zoar. He moved to the hills. He lived in a cave with his daughters. Friends, he chose the luscious but sinful land, and it left him living basically alone in a cave. Once again, we see the deceitfulness of sin. It never provides what it promises. But the ending gets worse. His daughters realize they don't have any children. They have no chance of marrying anyone while living by themselves in a cave, but they want to have children. And so the older one devised a plan to get her dad drunk and commit incest with him. She does this and thinks the plan worked so well that her sister should do the same thing the following night, which is exactly what she does. And in a sick and twisted sort of way, the plan actually works. They both end up pregnant and they give birth to sons out of an incestuous relationship with their father. Now, this sounds like the passage ends with our minds immersed in human wickedness. Not God's sovereignty over human wickedness. I mean, it seems like this is human wickedness gone out of control. And I want to point out something. 
the last couple of verses tell us that one of these boys became the father of the Moabites and the other became the father of the Ammonites, which even their names, if you read footnotes in your Bible, even their names were a perpetual reminder of the incestuous relationship from which they came, these people came. In the book of Numbers, we learn that the Moabites and the Ammonites mistreated the Israelites on their way to the promised land. There was some rift that took place through the years between the Israelites and the Moabites and Ammonites. But there's more to that story. Because we have the story in our Bible of Ruth. Have you ever read the story of Ruth? You should go and read it this week. It's so much better than the story of Lot, okay? Cleanse your mind from the story of Lot with the story of Ruth this week. Now, you might think, oh my word, Zach has gotten really off track here. Hang tight with me for just a moment. To make a short story, the the story of Ruth is a short story, but I'm going to make it really short. Ruth was a foreigner who ended up a widow after her Israelite husband died. She left her home country to go back to Israel with her mother-in-law. And through a series of events, she ended up marrying another Israelite man named Boaz, who happened to be a descendant of Abraham. The last two verses of the book of Ruth tell us this. Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. That's the last line in the story of Ruth. So Boaz and Ruth... Ruth, we know, is a, is a foreigner. Boaz is an Israelite. They, they, their great-grandson is King David. Okay, Their great-grandson is King David. Now, if we jump ahead about a thousand years in the story of God's word, we learn that Jesus, the Messiah, the promised offspring of Abraham, the one who would endure the wrath of God in our place on the cross so that we could be rescued from God's wrath, that Jesus was descended from David, which means he was descended from who? Ruth and Boaz. Matthew even mentions Ruth by name in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. We say, Zach, you've lost your mind. You've taken too much cold medicine this week. Uh, it's, gone, it's, gone, it's gone to your brain. Uh, what, what are you talking about? What in the world does this have to do with Lot's drunken, incestuous relationship with his daughters? I read to you the last verse of the book of Ruth, which connects Ruth to David and ultimately to Jesus. Now I want to read to you from the opening of the book of Ruth. I'm going to skip a few verses. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. You catch it? Ruth the great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother of Jesus, the rescuer, was a Moabite. She was a descendant of Lot through his his incestuous relationship with his daughter. Friends, Jesus' lineage traces back to both Abraham and to Lot. Friends, only God could write a story like this. This doesn't mean that God approved of the actions of Lot's daughters. Their actions were wicked in every way. But what it does show is that God is sovereign over human wickedness. Not only does wickedness not stop his plan of rescue, God sovereignly uses human wickedness to bring about his plan of rescue. This doesn't mean he's the author of evil, but it does clearly mean he is greater than the evil. Church, if God were not sovereign over evil, there would be no hope of rescue from his wrath, which will one day be unleashed against all evil. But he is. He is sovereign over evil. He is faithful to his word, and he shows mercy to sinners, and thus he has divinely intervened with a plan of rescue. (coughs) And ultimately, that rescue depends upon that promised descendant of Abraham, who traced his earthly lineage through Lot and through Ruth, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Friends, Jesus came and he suffered the wrath of God in our place so that if we would believe in him, we could be rescued from God's wrath. We don't know when his wrath is coming, but we know it is coming and it will come suddenly, so we must be prepared. Jesus warned us of this. Jesus warned us of the day of God's wrath. And you know how he warned us? He warned us by pointing back to the story of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus said this in Luke 17, Just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, 
fire and sulfur rain from heaven and destroyed them all, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Friends, we don't need to fear that day. Because the Son of Man who is coming to unleash his wrath upon human wickedness came the first time to, in his own words, give his life as a ransom for many. I want to close by reading a verse from John's gospel account of Jesus. John chapter 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. There's only two ways. Apart from Jesus, the wrath of God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Escape from God's wrath, eternal life with God forever. Friend, the sobering reality of God's wrath should lead us to trust God's divine plan of rescue. Have you done that? Have you done that? I don't care what else you have going on in your life right now. It is not as important as this, that you have trusted in Jesus to save you from your sin. And if we have, are we warning people about God's wrath sharing with them the good news that they can be rescued from it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and mercy and grace in our lives. God, apart from your grace, our end would be certain, and it would be certain eternal punishment forever and ever and ever. But God, because you have loved us through Jesus, because you have this divine plan of rescue that you have been sovereignly working throughout human history to bring to fruition, God, because of Christ, we can be rescued and we can have life. We thank you for your grace. We know that we have done nothing to deserve salvation we do nothing to contribute to salvation lord our salvation really looks like lot there in the city with you grabbing us and lifting us out of our sin and our shame and our rebellion god you do that work as we place our faith in you god if there's someone here today who hasn't trusted in jesus god i pray that right now they would believe in jesus for salvation and god you have promised And you always keep your promises that everyone who believes in Jesus will be saved. Thank you for that confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.